It's now my pleasure to call to the stage Marisa Baradaran, who is the Associate Dean for Strategic Initiatives and the Robert Cotton Alston Associate Chair in Corporate Law at the School of Law at the University of Georgia. I'll turn it over uh, to you. I actually am no longer at the University of Georgia. I just moved to the University of California. So just, hey, West Coast. Um, okay, so um, I'd like to talk about the racial wealth gap today. Um, and I have some slides here to help me. There it is. Um, I'm gonna talk about the racial wealth gap and um, uh, show the role of credit policies, economic theories, and the banking and financial system in creating and perpetuating it. So as you see, the racial wealth gap is large, um, it's growing, and it doesn't abate even with a college education. So it's a structural issue that I'll um, talk about. And also, it has not abated over time. So in 1865, the share of wealth for the black population was about 0.5%. This is 1865, right on the heels of eman emancipation. Today, um, that number is about 1%. Okay. So um, to say that our public policy efforts to eradicate the wealth gap have been a total failure is an understatement. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm glad that the, the last speaker ended on talk about markets because I think one of our um, the biggest obstacles to closing the wealth gap are the myths that we tell our, ourselves about markets um, and uh, how how they work. So, for example, the promise of the free market uh, free market capitalism is that it does not discriminate. Okay, free markets. Um, offer equal opportunity for all to trade and prosper based on one's skill and ability to produce. That is, you know, Adam Smith, Milton Friedman um, theory. Um, yet, of course, history reveals that in fact, in fact, markets do discriminate, or alternatively, uh, that the American economy has never borne any resemblance to a free market. Uh, for most of our history, uh, blacks have been excluded from occupations, schools, neighborhoods, and trades, and their property was not protected by law. Um, in each historical moment when wealth was being created, whether through the Homestead Act, uh, FHA credit, and I'll talk a little bit about some of these, um, uh, and black communities were shut out of land and wealth accumulation. Moreover, and I want to focus on this too because I think this is still happening, um, that at certain pivot points in history, specifically during Reconstruction and the Civil Rights era, where black communities were demanding state intervention and capital to remedy past injustices, the rhetoric of free market capitalism was used as a weapon uh, to undercut their claims. Uh, so instead of real reform, uh, the black community was offered a self-help market of segregated banks and businesses. In other words, uh, leaders upholding the dominance of white market institutions promised that the market would fix the problems that had been created by law and backed by violence. Um, so I, I want to focus on this. I'm going to um, uh, go back uh, here to uh, Reconstruction. Um, so in the quick history that follows, I want to demonstrate that insofar as the levers of power were held by whites and the economy was based on racial subordination, markets would perpetually block black capital accumulation with the help of state power. Um, so during Reconstruction, the freedmen were expected to make the transition from being capital to becoming capitalists. Um, freedmen and their abolitionist allies demanded land as a form of reparation and, of course, as punishment for uh, the treason treasonous Confederates. Uh, without land, they understood that freedom and justice would be meaningless and participation in capitalism would be a farce. Uh, President Andrew Johnson uh, vetoed the land grant and the Freedmen's Bill, except for one provision, which I'll come back to. He reasoned that the freedmen would be protected by the free market and contract law, that they would just bargain for fair wages to buy their own land. Um, so this was either unbelievably naive or incredibly cynical. The southern economy was nothing like a free market. Whites refused to sell property to blacks. Southern legislators, lawyers, and judges drafted laws governing black labor. Um, they restricted them from trade. Um, vagrancy laws um, were prevalent. And wages were capped by a cabal between employers. Uh, and any violation of these contracts led to sort of convict labor, which was then a new form of slavery. By the end of the Reconstruction era, most freedmen were left landless, voteless, and practically every possession blocked to them. Their only choice was to grow cotton. 
Um, of course, that was the point. Uh, the worldwide cotton market was heavily dependent on cheap and abundant um, cotton from the United States. In order to have cotton exports, the freedmen had to grow it. And for that to happen, they could not be landowners. Uh, America could not go the way of Haiti, where after the independence, um, the Haitians uh, refused to grow sugar, uh, and the output halted. They grew when, when the freed uh, slaves in Haiti got their own land, sorry, um, they grew subsistent crops, right? So when you have a tract of land, you're going to grow crops that you can eat, okay? So not uh, the debt crops like um, sugar or cotton. So, so this is why uh, the, free, the 40 acres and a mule fails. Freedmen get no, no land. In the meantime, the federal government is actively providing free land to private railroads for, the expansion, uh, for their expansion and also um, through homesteaders, through the Homestead Acts. Um, blacks were denied land, of course, not because the government was constrained by laissez-faire, uh, like Andrew Johnson said, but because, as Andrew Johnson explained, uh, America was and should remain a white man's government. Uh, so um, instead of getting the land, what the freed slaves got was a bank um, in 1865. Uh, so Union General Otis Howard um, explained that the bank was better, a savings account was way better than getting land because it would teach them about thrift and savings. And he said freedmen should earn land and not receive it as a gift. Right. Um, the Freedmen Savings Bank was one of the only tangible creations of the Reconstruction Era Freedmen's Bureau. No bank before or ever since uh, has resembled the Freedmen's Bank. Uh, it was created by Congress, signed into law by in Lincoln uh, with a special charter. Even the Federal Reserve was still decades away. And the bank was immediately successful. The bank was immediately successful and it was embraced by the freed slaves. Um, the main reason that they trusted the bank was that the money um, that the passbooks and all the, 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 the paraphernalia of the bank um, and, and the notes looked like it was uh, backed by the federal government. Um, the bills and the notes were covered with government insignia and they seemed to be sort of connected um, to the treasury. Um, and of course the mission of the bank was to hold their money in, uh, in a safe and, and safeguard it. Um, the capital of the bank grew to what, was, what would today amount to about $1.5 billion. Um, it was not um, protected by uh, the Treasury. And, and back in the day, right, a bank that offered notes, you judge the note based on the reputation of the bank. So you would get a note from, let's say, J.P. Morgan's bank, and it was worth $100, and you would just take it at face value because you understood that it was J.P. Morgan, where some podunk bank in, let's say, Colorado, you would have to discount it because it might not be around when you went to go collect your note. So the fact that they had Lincoln's face on it and the, the government insignia meant to, to show that it was backed by um, the Treasury. Um, it wasn't, and what happened with that $1.5 billion is that the, the manager of the bank, uh, this guy named Henry Cook, um, his cousin is Jay Cook, white, white managers, um, speculated the money in what, what was then the sort of subprime crisis of the day, which was railroad bonds, and they, um, lost it, it went away. Um, so depositors lost about half of their deposits. Um, and the significance of this failure reverberates and lingers through the community. W.E. Du Bois says not even 10 additional years of slavery would have done so much to throttle the thrift of the freedmen as the mismanagement of the bank and bankruptcy of the freedmen's bank chartered by the nation for their special aid. So I started this project um, looking at the data of unbanked and underbanked um, that the FDIC provides every year, and I was finding some really weird results that um, unbanked and underbanked for whites and for other races are about less than 10%. For blacks, especially in the South, it was up to 60%. And the number one um, reason they were saying that they didn't want to um, use banks is because of a lack of trust. Okay, and you start digging in, and I looked at all these documents, and it, a lot of bankers still talked about the Freedmen's Bank. It took generations for families to recover from this failure, and that those stories got passed down. You cannot trust the government banks. You can't trust banks. And so they created their own um, banking system. And I'll talk a little bit about that for a second and, and kind of talk about why this is important. If you cannot trust these government organizations, um, once they're working for you, you have a lot of um, gaps to overcome, especially because it wasn't just a, a failure, it was a looting. Um, they, were, they were robbed. 
of their um, savings. And so how, how do you trust again when they say, okay, they're safe this time? Um, so after this, um, there was a lot of um, self-help organizations. So after the failure of the Freedmen's Bank, um, you have banks like uh, Maggie Walker's Bank, um, forming, and these are, and this is where we get back into health care and insurance, they were doing everything. This is in the Jim Crow South, most of the populations in the South, and they, you know, uh, Maggie Walker's bank had, she had a college fund, she had insurance, they um, offered sort of health care, um, sort of c c communal health care, banking, etc. cetera, um, because there, these things weren't being offered elsewhere. So to, to tie into health care, at the time, uh, there was this uh, research by this guy named um, Frederick Hoffman, who wrote this report called Race Traits and Tendencies. Okay, he was an um, insurance, uh, appraise, or insurance underwriter for, I can't remember which, Prudential MetLife, one of the former uh, companies, and he looked at the black population and he makes this, this pseudo-scientific claim that he's measuring sort of um, bodies and, and all this stuff, and he says, um, the, the black population is going to go extinct because uh, there's more diseases and, and malnourishment. And so he decides that this has nothing to do with the fact that they are um, overworked, uh, they don't have adequate housing or health care, they're segregated. It is not that. It is a race trait. It is endemic to their race. And he has all of these maps and stuff. So he convinces insurers, life insurers, and medical insurers to not insure blacks because they're because of the pseudo crap science that he's using, right? So what do black insurers do? It becomes the biggest market uh, in uh, black business. They come in and they fill this void, right? Um, so the biggest markets become insurance and banking also because that, a lot of times banking and insurance go together. So this is what Maggie Walker does. Um, so uh, this is uh, happening in the South, and then you have sort of the great migration between 1910 and, and 1940, where um, you know uh, it's the biggest mass migration in this country. Um, millions of uh, blacks move out of the South because of the hostility, the Klan. Also, bull weevil is taking down their cotton crops, and they're being moved, uh, being pulled up north by the industrial sort of new jobs and the, the economy that's up north. And of course, when they get up north, they're met with segregation, which of course leads to concentrated populations um, in northern cities. Um, and uh, you know, a, a lot of housing disparity, but also opportunities for businesses to develop, especially in places like Chicago, um, Baltimore, and New York. And this is the heyday of a segregated black economy. And what I show in my analysis is even in that situation where you have wage earners in a segregated community, it's impossible to keep that money inside the community because of the property differentials. Whites owned all the property, and when you start with one race owning all the property and one race not, um, these, these institutions, these businesses, these banks cannot make a profit. Why? Because your deposits are from low-income people, and so you're spending more to service the deposits. The homes, again, are in communities where the first few black buyers in a white community pay a premium, and then the community flips over, and then the whites all leave. So then the house prop, the prices drop. And unfortunately, this is still the case today. Um, neighborhoods tip over into black or brown, and then there's white flight, and those property values decline. And so it's really difficult to build wealth among that, um, uh, in those housing conditions. And this is a way where racism actually shows up on balance sheets, and you can see how that wealth is extracted based on people's preferences of who they want as neighbors. We still live in a society, unfortunately, where people with money can um, choose to self-segregate based on race. And by race, I mean whiteness. Um, and, uh, and, and so you have these um, disparate things. And then with that comes the school inequalities, the health inequalities, and all of the other ways that, uh, that wealth affects um, your day-to-day -day existence. OK, if it had ended there with the market, that would have been um, fine, but it didn't. Um, in the, the New Deal, um, uh, Roosevelt makes this explicit. Between 1933 and 1970, the FHA is basically creating the American suburb and intergenerational wealth 
for a lot of families. So what happens is they go, these appraisal, appraisers from the HOLC create these maps all over the country. This is Chicago's, um, I, I could probably do one for Colorado, and they go around and they're, um, the FHA is saying, if you lend on a um, low risk mortgage, we will guarantee that loan, which means, and we, we will set the term, so you're paying 3% um, interest, you know, 6%, um, you're paying 6% interest on the mortgage, they're getting 3% on their deposits, it's, it's a machine, right? And then the, the government will take the default risk, okay? So banks are basically printing money, right? If you can lend on into that, um, an FHA mortgage into that zone, all your risks are covered, you're just making money from these people are pay that are paying their mortgage. But it only works in the green and blue areas. So how do they um, decide risks? You I don't know if you can see this map. This is one um, um, assessment, an actual assessment by an HOLC appraiser in Atlanta, which is an area I know well. That, that little spot right there um, that's pointed out in red, that area right there is um, where Spelman and Morehouse College is. And so if you look, this is, this is the appraiser for that area, okay? And what the appraisal says, if you look at the top lines, it's percent Negro, um, and then percent infiltration of, meaning how, how close are blacks to this area? What is the percentage of likelihood that they will come into this area? And then percent foreign born, percent infiltration. Those are the first two. So what this reveals is this, the, you know, the HOLC appraisers went into this area and they say, look, this is a lot of business professionals. We've got Morehouse and Spelman. This is the best black neighborhood in the country, but it's 100% black, okay? So what do they market? Red, okay? Red is high risk, do not lend to this area. Okay, so this is the best black neighborhood in the, in the, in the country, and it's, it's um, high risk. So this, this then cements those segregation patterns from 1934. We're still living with the effects of these maps. So what this means is if you're getting an FHA mortgage, you're living in a suburb, you're paying less in mortgage payments than you, are, than you were in rent in your previous areas. So you look at places like Levittown, where people are leaving, blue collar workers are leaving Manhattan, you're going to Jersey, you're going to Pennsylvania, you're paying now $50, and it's hard to remember, rem that that's how much they paid in mortgage. You were paying you know, $50 in rent in your tenement house in Manhattan, now you're paying 35 on your mortgage, you live in a, a white suburb, you've got movie theaters and cars and um, all of this stuff, um, meanwhile, uh, the, the segregated spaces um, get, get stuck in that. Something else that happens in that, um, it's not just the mortgages, okay? There's, there's another um, consumer lending thing that goes on top of this. And the reason I'm focusing on this is because you're still seeing the effects of this. Um, believe it or not, intergenerational wealth lasts, you know, people were alive when this was happening. So, so it, it lasts a long time until you upset it. So what's happening is, in the suburbs, in the white suburbs, not only are you getting the FHA mortgage, but you're also getting revolving credit to buy the appliances. So remember post-war, everyone's buying a car or a refrigerator, television, whatever, we have, we have stuff now. Uh, we've got you know, laundry machines and all this um, stuff, and you're buying it with credit. So you get a revolving credit card, which is rolled over interest. It's a super flexible way to buy this stuff. You get it from your, um, uh, the department store, but you can use it anywhere. Revolving credit it was another FHA program, and it allows the lenders to sell up that debt upstream through the secondary market. And what that means is if you can sell your debt to the secondary market, you can lower the interest rates. So in the suburbs, you're getting revolving credit you're with low interest, and it's flexible. Okay, why? Because you have that wealth and you have that ability to reduce risk through the secondary market. In the black ghetto, and I'm gonna use the word ghetto, um, I, 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 not, not because I, I like that word, but because it's more accurate than saying black community. I think community indicates some sort of self-selection, and I think this was more forced than um, self-selected. So in the black ghetto, what you have is um, installment credit. And installment credit is night and day from revolving credit because they're not able to reduce risks. You're buying your furniture, your, um, your refrigerator, all of this stuff on installment. It's getting bundled together, okay? You're paying three to five times as much as you would be paying 
outside. And if you miss one payment, you lose it all. And you don't lose it in a normal sort of lose it way. You get the repo men and the cops. It's, it's a very onerous credit system, OK? So what happens is um, the early civil rights movement starts to happen in these black spaces. So you get a lot of black community groups in Harlem and in Chicago doing boycotts and protests saying, this is unfair, right? We're seeing what's happening, and the lenders are this, this way that this oppression is, is sort of um, making its way felt because that's, that's, where they're paying, that's where they're seeing all their wealth um, extracted. Um, so uh, they start these boycotts, and then there's these court cases where um, these uh, lenders go to the court and say, hey, a boycott is illegal. They can't be doing this, right? And the courts come back and say, no, actually, this is perfectly legal. They can boycott you. So those are the seeds um, of the early movement. So this is in 1935, that court case. And Martin Luther King um, is moved by this, OK? So the Montgomery bus boycott um, stems directly from this. So Martin Luther King in 1950 uh, takes, or so, so you have the black nationalist movement coming up north, and they're saying, why should the white people be running the banks in our community, okay? But on the other side is Martin Luther King, and I won't go through this, but um, in 1950, Martin Luther King takes his case to, to the black population. He says, we have several goals in this civil rights movement. This is before the Montgomery bus boycott, before he becomes a national player. He has the top five or six goals that he wants to accomplish. And the top three, one is we want to establish our own credit unions to avoid these um, onerous debt. Two is we want to establish our own community banks. Three is financial coordination. Number six was voting, OK? So really, the, the, the purpose of this is to use this economic um, boycott and uh, sort of coordination as a way to fight uh, these, these things. And so, you know, if you look at his, and I, this is a lot of words for a slide, um, but if you look at his I Have a Dream speech, it's really um, cabined in the language of economic redress, right? Um, his wife was a, Coretta was a um, teller at the bank, a black-owned bank in Atlanta. He served on several board, uh, bank boards, and he really believed in this economic um, stance and, and goes back to it after the civil rights laws are passed. Because what Martin Luther King understands, and some policymakers did not, is the, the civil rights laws, and the, the civil rights law and the voting rights law, all those do is guarantee the rights that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment already had given to the black population, OK? And what the government is saying with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act is, we're serious this time, OK? Um, we're going to enforce this, all right? But all they were, right to vote, right to not have, not have to deal with Jim Crow and racial discrimination, OK? Everyone, though, understood that the movement had to go and undo this, these wealth effects, the segregation effects, and the employment effects that all of those um, years of segregation and Jim Crow had created. Um, so uh, the Federal Reserve had a um, study in 1967 that said that um, uh, blacks had one-fifth the wealth of white families, and half of black children were growing up in deep poverty compared to 9% of white children. OK? Um, everything changes, of course. Um, and, and Martin Luther King, I'm sorry, M Martin Luther King's right last movement is a poor people's campaign. This is his last speech, right? Before he's killed in Memphis, he says, take your money out of the banks downtown. It was a very, um, you know, it was, a, it was a union protest, but also an economic protest. So he really focuses on this. But um, the, the appetite is no longer there for forward momentum. Roger Wilkins of the NAACP says in 1966, it would have been hard to pass the Emancipation Proclamation in the atmosphere prevailing right now. Okay, So everything changes from 1965 to 1968. The Civil Rights Law, the Voting Rights Law, Brown versus Board of Ed, the bus boycott, Selma, all of that happens before 1965. Okay, By 1968, um, by 1969, Malcolm X, King, John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy had all been killed. Johnson is out of office. The consensus of the black community toward the civil rights movement, if there was one, was that it had failed or that it was incomplete. 
Um, but at the same time, black protests are um, turning into a res or resistance movement, and black ghettos across the country are erupting in violence. To many, it feels like a domestic war, especially when the National Guard is sent in um, to deal with the, um, the uh, insurgency. Um, CBS says, look, this is not a riot. It's an insurrection against all authority. There are several commissions that study the riots. This is during still the last days of the Johnson administration. The Kerner Commission was the most um, uh, sort of uh, thorough. And the report is scathing. Johnson had to fire the first reporters, and then he got the second report. He kind of filled it with this guy. Kerner is his guy that was going to kind of tamp it down. And what the report says, this is the second report, the one that was more um, toned down. He says, what white Americans have never fully understood, but what the Negro can never forget, is that white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. So the Kerner Commission's report is, we have, we have to fix this, or else we're going to two separate and unequal societies that this will never fix itself. There were also a couple large hearings that I, felt, uh, that I looked at you know, in the banking committee. That's where I uh, usually focus. And this is, um, they're looking at what's going on with these riots from a banking lens. And they, they rely on a report by the FTC and a couple of academics um, to, to see what's going on here. And what they're finding out is a couple of things. One is that the rioters um, are targeting the lenders. Okay, it's not just random white property destruction, right? It is, they're saying things like burn the books, right? They're going in and they're, and they're looking at the, the, the sort of site of, um, of the problem. Two, and this is the one everyone kind of talks about, and I'll talk about it in a second, um, that these rioters are leaving black lenders and black businesses alone, um, think, uh, called, uh, you know, like the Soul Brother establishments. And three, this is the one that is supported by both studies but ignored by everyone else, is that these lenders are not making a profit. They just operate in a different, or they're making a profit, but not like hand over fist. 94% of their costs are because it's harder to lend into these markets. The risks are higher, the defaults are higher, there's lower wealth, you can't sell up to the secondary market, so they have to charge more. Okay, there are two different markets happening. Okay, and that's what explains some of these high costs, all right? Yet, some of the, the, the solutions become, let's throw more black businesses and black lenders into this, okay? Um, they're sort of missing this, this big market sort of macro explanation for this. So, so these programs um, end up s starting in the Johnson administration, but get really hyped up during the election. So 1968 election, I want to come back to this because this is a super pivotal moment, and I'll explain why it matters in just a second. Um, going into 68, you've got Robert Kennedy, you've got Hubert Humphrey, um, and George Romney and N Nelson Rockefeller are kind of big candidates who are actually pushing legitimate civil rights plans. George Romney, right, this is Mitt's dad, describes the white suburb as a high-income white noose around the black inner city, and he said it was the federal government's job to fix it, okay? Um, he doesn't win, Nixon wins, and decides to use this white backlash against the protests as part of his Southern strategy. Uh, so Nixon um, couldn't explain like Andrew Johnson had done that this is a white man's government, but he and his top aides admit that the subliminal appeal to, the, I'm just quoting, the subliminal appeal to the anti-black voter was always present, present in Nixon's speeches. So what his campaign does is they take the language of the black power movement, and what they do instead is they say black capitalism. What is black capitalism? What it means is we're going to use free market capitalism um, to, against all of these economic justice demands. Okay, so you're saying integration, we're saying free markets. You're saying reparations, we're saying capitalism. Okay, so they're undercutting all this stuff. They, it ends up becoming very little. It's, you know, um, affirmative action, voluntary affirmative action by a few companies. It's de treasury deposits in banks. It's just calling these areas, instead of the ghetto, we're now going to call it um, enterprise zones and opportunity zones. And we're going to let um, the market take care of it. Okay, so now you see where I'm going. 
This was so successful that it has remained unchanged. We don't call it black capitalism anymore. We call it community enterprise. We call it community development. Um, uh, so this is Nixon. Reagan um, really hones in on this, right? He says tax cuts. Tax cuts is his civil rights plank. Okay? The free market will naturally get rid of discrimination. Black-owned businesses, a free economy helps defeat discrimination by fostering opportunity for all. Clinton really doubles down on community empowerment. Um, he um, he you know, cuts down welfare, um, and, and now he's promising he does a CDFI Act, which I'm not going to knock, right, because it does some great things, but what it relies on is, he calls it niche, Larry Summers is his um, economic advisors, he says these niche banks are going to go in and, and have win-win profits. Nixon kind of relied on voluntary help. Nick, um, Clinton and his team are offering profits. He's saying, look, you're going to go in as a bank with this superior knowledge or a developer and you're going to make profits in these black spaces. Okay? Eventually, of course, the entrepreneurs find profits and it comes in subri subprime. 2008, black families lose 53% of their wealth, which they have not recovered. Um, uh, Bill Clinton, Obama, to his credit, didn't really do a lot here, um, but still kind of doubles down. Trump's opportunity zones, his plan with uh, uh, black America. So we're still living in this, in this market. And, you know, um, I think we need to go back to 1968 and consider what was on the table by everyone who understood what was going on. And the plans were either integration or reparations, all of which involved capital. Hubert Humphrey tells Nixon, you can't have black capitalism without capital. But that's essentially what he was doing. And, and t same, same with today. You cannot disrupt these forces without actual um, policy. You cannot let the market fix were public policy over centuries created. Um, so that is uh, uh, the conclusion. I didn't get to finish, but thank you. That's it. <laughs>